Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey. And this time we are going to be talking about the 2024 Challenge Cup, which is a smaller competition held in Telberg, Netherlands. Now, I will say we didn't really get to see all of this event. No, maybe 50%. Am I being generous? I mean, we had to hunt and peck to find all these things. <laughs> it was available as a paid stream, but everything that we were seeing online with it was that, one, it didn't seem like that paid stream was very good, not well shot, a lot of like bad frame rates, just didn't seem like a quality thing to spend 25 euro on so we ended up relying on the generosity of strangers on YouTube and on Twitter to uh, post all those things. And some of the people who were shooting stuff live from the venue on Twitter had better video than what the actual paid live stream had. Yes, that was actually really, really helpful. So thank you, fans, because it was fun to also see some of your shoots from inside the building where you were showing a lot of toys being thrown to some of the skaters like Katja Kurakova and Kaori Sakamoto, which was also fun POV video. Yes, in particular, there was a really fun moment at the end of Kaori Sakamoto's free skate where they weren't allowed to throw stuffies on the ice at this event because there weren't any sweepers. So when people were going to the kiss and cry, they were just getting rained with toys there. And there was a moment where we saw that that was really fun, but also the cameraman seemed to have left for coffee or something while that shot was going on. <laughs> So he didn't follow Cowrie to the kiss and cry. Thankfully, there were fans who were actually there who filmed it, like you said, as a POV. So we got to see them literally dropping toys on Cowrie and her laughing as they bounced off of her and startled her and stuff. And it was really, really cute. It was adorable. There weren't a large number of what we would think of as internationally significant competitors at this event. But there were a handful of some of our favorites that were there basically kind of sneaking in one last competition before the world championships. And there are also a couple of other competitions that happened last week and this week that we're going to hit on a little bit once we get done with this. But I think probably what we should do is just jump into what I think of as the highlight of Challenge Cup, which was the women's event. Yes, the women's event was definitely the most noteworthy here with Kaori Sakamoto, Nina Petrokina coming back from injury. But I think the standout was really Yuna Aoki. Oh, no question. Yuna Aoki is the story of this entire competition, for sure. And if you're not familiar, Yuna has been on the scene for a while. She's, I think, a 22-year-old competitor. She's hasn't had a ton of international experience, particularly this season. We've seen her twice, I believe. She's always been this gorgeous skater and interestingly choreographs some of her own material, including her short program this season, which is extraordinary but has often been kind of a, I guess, mid-tier, you'd say, Japanese skater. Here, you would not know that. Both of her programs were just exceptional, really strong, to the point where she ended up in uh, the silver medal position. And yes, yeah, she had a 209.37, which is, I mean, the fourth highest score of any senior woman this season. In international competition, yeah. Yeah. And she does take second here, and I know we're kind of going out of order the way we normally approach this, but what I really think is interesting about this is that, like you said, Yuna is 22. She is not one of the most recognizable Japanese women because the Japanese single skating is such a deep field. And this same event has Kaur Sakamoto, who does win the event and is barreling her way towards Worlds. But it is worth noting here that Yuna Aoki won the short program. And she won it definitively by like five points yeah, over Cowrie. With a 72. That's a great score for a short program. And it was deserved. It was absolutely the best program we saw at this competition, I think, by anyone that skated. And I want to particularly note her triple Lutz, triple loop combination was just stellar in both programs. Just really on point. I really think that Yuna's short program at this event is one of the best short programs of the season, period. This deep in, you know, we've seen so many different competitions and performances, and I wouldn't have expected Challenge Cup to be one of the places where I would see the real takeaways. And it frustrates me that there isn't better film of this event with more angles and better production, because I think that short program from Yuna Aoki would be one of those highlights of the season videos that you'd watch over and over. You still can. It's just not recorded to the level that it deserves because it's so good. But that's not to take anything away from her free skate. 
because her free skate was lyrical and beautifully performed. She doubled one jump in it, which yeah, I think her triple it, salco. Yeah, which is not the most significant mistake that you could make in a free skate by any means. And otherwise, it's a clean skate. And it's just lovely. But those back to back performances, like you said, it was a 72.01 in the short program, 137.36 in the free skate at a total of 209.37. You got to look at this and go, oh, my gosh, why is she not going to Worlds? But we only saw her once on the Grand Prix this season and she was a standout and everybody was like, wow, we're really taking notice of her. But then she's in the interviews after this event talking about the fact that she's debating whether or not to retire at the end of this season. No, please. Right. Because she's 22. She's about to finish university and she's trying to figure out what the next steps are for her career, of which I would hope at least part of it would be choreography because she is really, really good as a choreographer. But this skating here should put everybody else in the women's division on notice. But to your point, we did go out of order and Kaori Sakamoto did deliver enough here to take the title. And other than a doubled Lutz in her short and a fall on her triple loop in the free skate, we saw an overall very strong Kaori Sakamoto making a point of competing again before Worlds. And I really felt like that was what she needed. As much as I'm sure she would have loved to have had clean skates here, maybe it'll just add a little bit of fuel to the fire to get her more prepared for Worlds. That's what I'm hoping. But overall, I think it was a solid showing and a good warm-up event for her. Yeah, I think for Kauri, what we want to see here is for her to get those mistakes out of the way so that when she shows up at Worlds, she's fixed those little problems and that she's warmed up and ready to go. We've seen in past years that she always does these free skates with this ambitious jump right at the very end. It's like one of those signature Kauri things. And those last jumps tend to haunt her a little bit as well. So seeing her fall on that here is not that surprising because this is kind of in the wheelhouse of Cowrie's system to have that issue, break it down, fix it, and then show up at the next event and have it repaired and good to go. Outside of those couple of errors, though, we saw exactly what you expect from Cowrie Sakamoto. Big speed, immense quality, huge double axles, and just beautiful skates that look like a world champion. She had so much fight. I will say that whole free skate, you could feel it in her. So that's one of my favorite things about Kaori Sakamoto is her level of competitiveness and fight through every program. So I'm looking forward to seeing her there. But in third, what was nice to see is Lorin Schild from France. Yeah, this has been a real come up season for Lorin. She won French Nationals just a little while back. And then she placed really well at Europeans in a, a really exciting event with a lot of talent in it. Lorraine is not, you know, a marquee name in the international scene, but she has really been showing up with strong programs. You can see her fighting through them at some points, but you see the fight. You see that she's putting in the real committed effort to deliver strong jumps, to give us well-defined programs. And the scores, you look at the end result here, her in third place with a total of 176.68 is 33 points behind Yunia Aoki in the second position. So there is a lot of room for Lorraine to come up before she is competitive against the top women in the world, of which Yunia Aoki really made a point of saying, hey, I'm one of them. But still, it is a really good building season for Lorraine, and I'm hoping that that translates to some confidence building for her going into the next season. In fourth here, and I do want to talk about this because it's concerning slash confusing on a lot of levels, is Katya Korakova. If you're watching skating these days, you know that name. You know how personable and funny and extroverted and flamboyant she is. But here, she had two pretty strong skates. I wouldn't say flawless by any stretch, but possibly one of the better competitions I've seen from her this season and uh, yeah, her scores did not really reflect that. And particularly her PCS scores in her long program, I want to talk about because she had a 53, which for context, that's what, eight to 10 points lower than she has gotten as a senior most of the time. So not really sure what the judges were looking for here. But if I were her and her coaching team, I would be concerned. This has been a consistent problem this entire season for Katya. She's delivered some really nice programs from small events to Grand Prix events. 
she did have a notable problem in the short program at the Europeans that washed her out of the free skate entirely. But in general, what we've seen is that the judges just do not want to reward her for anything. She has come back and won smaller competitions a few times, but usually after her short program was just torn to pieces. So she did throw away that early short program and has come in with a complete new one and still just can't seem to get across a certain point bar. Here, I mean, the short program was a little messy. It's not perfect. It wasn't awful, but she only walked away with a 56-19. But then you look at that free skate and it's good. I'm sure that there are problems that we weren't able to really see in the feed that we were watching. Sure. Like there's probably at least one or two under rotations or quarter turn under rotations. That feed does not give you a very good angle or a close up on things. So it's hard to tell. But it was still baffling to see her skate something that looked that nice to get such a crowd reaction and then to walk away with a 111.44. It was just concerning. And I just don't know what's going on there. I definitely want to dig into whether it's looking at skatingscores.com or if Jackie Wong is going to be posting anything just to better understand maybe some of the problems that we weren't able to see in a little bit more detail. But regardless, whenever I see a PCS score that low for a skater who has scored consistently much higher than that, it really does make it feel like, okay, the judges are telling you something that something is not going well in your skating overall. And we've talked about the fact that we would love to see Katja have a bit more stretch, a little bit more extension, a little more difficulty in her transitions going into jumps. Things like that would all help her considerably. But to be at the level that she's at and getting these scores and it continues to seem like she keeps getting scored down. If I were Brian Worser right now, I would be like, okay, we need to figure out what is happening, have a lot of conversations with judging teams and start looking at how to reboot everything. Yeah, because from the outside, it does not seem reasonable. You can certainly criticize plenty of little elements of Katya's skating, but in the end, she is still a high quality competitor and a veteran who has the track record to show that she's good. So it is baffling. I do want to mention one more skater before we move on to pairs, and that's Nina Petrakina, who is only in her second competition back after surgery. So really impressive that she's skating here at all. And to land in fifth place, and she also got a fourth place last week at the Talink Hotels Cup. So I'm really impressed with her. I don't know if she's even had a month out from that surgery and she's already skating. Nina Petrakina is a skater that we talked a lot about in the early part of the season. I like this skater a lot. She was really nice on the Grand Prix circuit. I think that she took bronze at Skate America. A little bit of diminishing returns as it went on afterwards. But then she broke something in training and it knocked her out of competition for a long stretch. So we didn't see her at Europeans or for continents. And so she has just come back. So to do as well as she did on a leg that still can't handle some of her jumps. She's talked about how there's some limitations of things that she just can't quite do yet. So you'll see her pop some things or struggle on some jumps that used to be easy for her. But it still feels like she's coming back strong and it was great to see her here. Absolutely. Well, I want to move us on to the pairs because this falls into the category we talk about a lot of the competition within the competition. Because the top two teams are both from Italy one, the reigning world bronze medalist of Conti and Machi, and number two, the now reigning European champions, Bakari and Guarisi. This one actually kind of surprised me a little bit because Conti and Machi came on strong at this event. I will say that I am still really bored with their material. And I was reading on Twitter, people talk about the fact that we knew that this free skate from them is a repeat from last year, but it also seemed like they went back to an earlier short program. And it's one that they have now done in four seasons. So there's just a lot of recycled material for this team. And I don't understand it because they're a quality team, but they seem to keep going back to the well. Like they can't find new material that works for them, but they delivered technically here. There's still a little trouble from Sarah Conti staying up on some of her jumps, but their lifts and overall speed and quality was really strong. Yeah, it was nice to see them come back and feel a little bit more themselves I'm sure they still would like to break that 200 point mark because they did not do that here. It was a 197.82. But regardless, considering the season they've had, this win could mean quite a lot for them because Italy only has two world seats 
going in and Bakari and Guarisi with their European championships win claim one of those. So now I think it's this coming Monday, Italy is going to decide who the other team is, whether it is Conti and Machi or Gilardi and Ambrosini, who've had a great season as well. So I think this will help their cause in getting them back to the world championships. That's a real tough question, though, between them, because reigning world medalists, you would feel like that's a fair shoe in but they've been really inconsistent this season versus Giardi and Ambrosini have really been on the come up. They deliver beautiful programs. I think if you were just looking at an average score over the season, they've done better than Conti and Machi. They had a terrific Europeans as well. They were bronze there. So of the two, I would go with Giardi on Ambrosini because I've been more impressed with them. But Conti and Machi really did make a case for themselves here. And they definitively defeated Bakari and Guarisi here. And last session, I said that I was like, Bakari and Guarisi are my pick for the top of the podium at the Olympics. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh like that. That feels really rude. To be fair, I made that pick to stir the pot a little bit because really we have no idea what it's going to look like in two years. No, it's so far away. And Paris is such a developing field. But yeah, I mean, they only got a 175-41 here total. So this was not a real strong event for them. They were very close in contention during the short program, but the free skate really let them down at this one. But still a second place finish. And then the French team of Kovalev and Kovalev came in third here. I was actually just happy to see them back on the ice again. They had a really rough time at Europeans. She had taken a terrible fall there and they had to withdraw from the event. So to see them back on ice and end up on the podium here is really cool. I also want to mention before we move on, I was really happy to see that Martins and Bedard got their world qualifying minimum here. So they're the second alternate, I believe, for the world team for the USA. But regardless, it's great for them going forward into next year. But also, like, you never know what's going to happen with a month away from the world. So them having that securely in their pocket just in case they get the call is wonderful. Yeah. And for the U.S. pairs teams where there's a lot of iffy teams in that discipline right now for the U.S. So to have another team that kind of has secured a slot and is ready to go. And it's also one of Brandon Frazier's teams. Yeah, that was really cool to see. Yeah, yeah. A fourth place finish here was pretty solid, and they weren't too far off third, so it was pretty good. In the men's division, I'm going to be totally honest, there's not much we saw. I wish we had gotten to see more, but we didn't see either of the programs for the winner, Mikhail Shiderov. But regardless, I'm thrilled for him. I'm so happy that he won. I mean, Mikhail has been terrific through this whole season. We've talked about how he's often criminally underscored, but he is a guy with great jumps, a developing artistry, a real sense of identity on the ice. The total score here at 256.34, this is not an internationally competitive score. When no. you look at the top men, this is not going to get anywhere near the top of the podium at Worlds. But putting another you know, medal under his belt or over his shoulders is a nice thing here. And he did it over a couple of fairly strong Japanese skaters. Absolutely. Like, I want to also give a big shout to Tatsuya Tsuboi, who landed in the silver medal position here, I think, unexpectedly with a 254.81. That was his first time internationally to break 250. For a young skater, that is a wonderful thing to do and very exciting for his career trajectory overall. We did get to see his short program, which was very strong, and he was actually in the lead after the short program. So a lot of promise with him. And so I was thrilled to see that for him. Yeah. And then in third place was the Japanese skater, Kazuki Tomono. We've talked a lot about Kazuki this season. This is a beautiful, lyrical skater with a ton of identity, a ton of personality, so much flair and charisma. But he has really struggled to have consistency this season with his jumps. That has really plagued him all along. It, it's kept him out of contention in, in a really strong Japanese field. Him landing in third here with a 251.61 is not a real great showing. But what we've seen of his skates, he's still just showing that beautiful artistry that makes him a joy to watch. You've got to hope that going into next season that he is putting some more work on figuring out how to make the jumps function for him because he's really getting left behind in that field of Japanese men that are so strong. I really feel for Kazuki because I feel like he is someone who is right there. He's got an identity. He is beautiful to watch. He has so much charisma. I could honestly just watch him all day 
His short program this year is one of my favorites. It's choreographed by Jeffrey Buttle. It is just perfect on him. And I hate when I see him not deliver what you know he's capable of. This 251.61 is only five points-ish off the gold medal. So it's not like he was too far behind. But I feel like he was, in my opinion, the favorite coming in. And his highest score this season was a 265.78. But at Worlds last year, he was almost a 274. So it's definitely a step down. And I want to see him continue to step forward. So I'm hoping that he can take the off season and reconfigure what those jumps look like. I know that this was sort of a rebuilding season for him because he wanted to develop a broader level of his artistry. He didn't want to be as typecast in his own types of programs, if you will. So I'm hoping that we're going to see a lot more from him in the next two years leading to the next Olympics. Over in Ice Dance, there was a pretty strong podium with a pretty definitive win from the French team of Damouge and Le Messier. That team, they were incredible at Europeans, really came on strong there. And here I felt like it was just a continuation of that theme. They are very strong, great material, and just have so much sell on the ice. They are definitely lining themselves up, maybe not as podium threats this quadrennial into this Olympics. But for the next one, they should be names that everyone knows. I feel like this is a team that early in the season I wasn't really too focused on, but they have forced me to become (laughs) a fan, essentially, because of how strong these programs are, uh, how much refinement that they're showing. They're a very well-matched team, and they really have been bringing a wonderful quality to the ice and very distinct in their style as well. They're also, if you've seen any interviews with them, they seem relatively delightful as people <laughs> as well. So it was really nice to see them. And they won by uh, by 10 points here. It was Which really Which in strong. Ice Dance is like huge. Yes. <laughs> but in Silver, it was awesome to see Olivia Smart and Tim Dieck take that step forward that we've been waiting for them to do. At least I felt like that's what I saw. Their twizzles have been flaky all season. I mean, they're a brand new team. So it's not that unexpected. Here, those looked pretty solid. Their speed still needs some work. Their lifts still need some work. They're coming together as a new partnership. So that's going to evolve with time. But them coming in second here with a pretty decent score of 180.64, I felt like was a really solid way for them to lead themselves into the world championships. I think that what we were seeing here were better looking programs than we've seen from them. I actually think they might have been just a tad underscored, but again, difficult to tell with some of the angles that we yeah, had available Yeah, it really to us. was hard from the video we were seeing. But there was a pretty demonstrable difference in lifts when you would watch them versus the French team. Demelje and Le Monsier had just exceptional lifts that were beautiful and Smart and Dick just don't quite have that just yet. But you could see, like you said, the twizzles were much improved. You would see that the problems they'd have were sometimes they'd get a little too spaced out from each other and you'd see them kind of close that gap and get tighter. So they are working on that. They're constantly improving so much personality on the ice. There's a lot of room to grow yet for this team, but they are definitely a pair that I love seeing. Oh, they've got all the personality. That's my favorite part of them. Yes, (laughs) yes. In third here, I think it was safe to say that it was expected that Fabri and Air would take this bronze medal from Canada, but I really do enjoy seeing them continue to grow as well. If there's something I want to see from this team, I want something different. I feel like there's a bit of a one note vibe Mm -hmm. to them. It's a beautiful note. They do it extraordinarily well. I just want to see something a little bit different. The thing with Fabri and Air is that oftentimes we talk about both in Paris teams and I stands teams where you have somebody who stands out and or maybe somebody who's a little bit weaker. With Fabri and Air, they feel so well matched, so evenly skilled. They are a singular unit on the ice, and that is a wonderful thing to see. But the programs don't have anywhere near as much life in them as like we saw from Smart and Dieck or the French team. There just isn't as much of an identity. There's a little bit of that sense of could be skating to anything at certain points in those programs. I think they need better material and I think that they need to find a bit more identity on the ice. But the skills are there all over the place. Yeah, they're really strong. They just need a little time to develop into what they could become. And to be fair to them, they basically had a huge pocket of time taken away from them because of Paul's injury. So they didn't have a ton of lead up time into this season. So it makes sense. 
But I agree. They have beautiful connection on the ice. They have tons of chemistry. They really bring you in to their story. I just want new stories. Like you said, I want different material from them. That's the Challenge Cup in a nutshell, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a huge competition by any stretch. Right. Obviously, there was a lot of other skaters there, but these are the ones who were most notable on the international circuit. Really, like I said, I mean, the highlight of this was Yuna Aoki, and that's the, the real takeaway from all of this was her performances. For sure. But there have been a few other items worth noting in different other competitions that are sort of the warm up towards the world championships that I think we should talk about. Uh, one of which happened last week. It was called the Talink Hotels Cup. It happened in Estonia. We didn't see all of this competition, but I think something that I particularly want to mention is Kalmiura. Kalmiura won this competition, but had a really tough long program and only got a total score of 242.95. It's worth noting his highest score this year is almost a 275. He's one of the three Japanese men going to the world championships. And this was a little concerning watching him here because it wasn't just, hey, I had a bad skate. I think you put it very well. He looked a little bit rocky, sort of like he used to like a year ago. Yeah. The observation I had was that this looked like the Calmura of last season pre Four Continents. One of the things that you could note with him in the past was that for all of his power and his ability, he sometimes looked kind of wild and a little reckless. And when he would get into a program where he didn't seem entirely confident, he could just throw away jumps or look like he was overpowering things. I think sometimes with Cal, if he's not feeling confident in something, his approach for that is to just overdo it. It's just to crank the power level to 11. And that sometimes results in messy jumps and problems. And that's what we saw here. So he won over a not deep competition, but he did it with a pretty garbage free skate, if we're being honest. His short program, gorgeous. That was really good. But that free skate had a lot of issues. So he's got some things to tighten up before he gets to Worlds because this is not the lead in to that that you would want. In the women's, and continuing to talk about the Japanese skaters, we saw kind of a disappointing performance from Hana Yoshida, who is going into Worlds as part of the Japanese team and who has been wonderful this season. Just not a very strong combination of skates for her. But the real story here is actually one of my faves, Rion Simiyoshi. Rion actually had a great short program and a, I wouldn't say it was a superb long program, but it was still good enough for gold here. Not her best score, but after a disappointing Japanese nationals, I think coming away with a win here had to be very impactful for her and will help her stay motivated and strong through the off season going into next season. Rion differentiates herself from a lot of the Japanese women's field in that she does have a quad toe and she has a lot of beautiful skating skills, but she doesn't always put it together. So, no. and I don't know if this is the end of her season. I'm not, I'm not, not sure. sure, but if this is the end of her season, this is not a bad way to finish off by grabbing a gold medal somewhere and then hopefully putting in the work towards really good programs for next season. But I'm always just happy to see her have some success because I do enjoy her a lot as a skater. And I think she has tons of room to grow. She is one of those young skaters who still needs to work a lot on her identity on ice and her artistry or overall presentation on the ice, but she'll get there. I have a lot of faith that we're going to see very big things from her in the future. And then over in Korea, there was this kind of interesting event called the Winter National Sports Festival. I think that's what it's called. I've seen it written several different ways, but that's the translation I'm going with. And to be honest, I don't quite understand how their podiums worked there because it seemed confusingly like everybody who got on the podium got a gold medal or something. I don't I don't get it. I need to do more research because I was trying before we recorded and I was getting more confused. I'm just going to roll with what we know, which was Cheon Kim scored really well and skated gorgeously here. And with a 209.99, that is a case making for the podium kind of score for the world championships. It's huge. And I really felt like this was the most confident version of Jaehyun Kim I've ever seen. So by way of comparison, her 209.99 is just a smidge above Yuneoki's. And this is a domestic competition yes. versus an international competition. So you always have to take scoring with a little bit of a grain of salt. For sure. And what I'll say here about Cheon Kim, this is the most comfortable and confident we've seen her all season. 
she looked so assured on the ice. She came out looking prepared, like there was not a care in the world for her to go out and deliver some really great programs. I don't think that they were as artistically complete as some of the stuff that we've seen Cheon do earlier in the season, but all of the technical, all of the jumps, all of the confidence that she had on display and that very solid score is a great way for her to set up for worlds because she looked ready. Very much so. I think the last thing I want to mention is that the Canadian national team was announced. And I got to admit, there was a part of me that had the Canadian nationals could have been an email kind of vibe because it was just a, well, of course, this is the team and not in any kind of it was right or wrong on every point, but mostly in the yet you didn't even have to go because we have one woman and it's Maddie Skeezes. So they decided to send Maddie over Kaya Ruder, who was the Canadian national champion. But Kaya is going to World Junior Championships. So I feel like they just sort of divided them up saying, OK, well, let's send our best in each division, essentially, because we can, because Kaya is 17 and can still, you know, squeak in there for juniors. I have mixed feelings about it. On one level, I worry sometimes that Maddie has already peaked and that the investment of time and energy and experience here would be more valuable for Kaya as the up and comer. At the same time, I think that you could send Kaya to Worlds and she would get annihilated by the field that's there and not come anywhere close to the top 10. And that could be actually really crushing for her, for her own personal confidence. Whereas you could send her to juniors and she's still going to face stiff competition there. Very. And when you've got Jia Shin and Mao Shimada and a lot of other great skaters going into that Worlds, it's going to be a tough one. But she has a greater opportunity to get higher up on the podium which for her own experience and track record might be the more positive thing to do. I'm really of two minds of it. And I, you know, I adore Maddie Skeezus as a skater and she is capable of delivering some really great programs. She's just been wildly inconsistent. Yes. In the category, I think that has the least controversy, the pairs that are going are Kellyanne Loren and Lucas Etrier, Leah Pereira and Trent Michaud, and obviously Deanna Salado Dudek and Maxime Deschamps. I have no notes. That all makes sense. It's all good. And I can't wait to see Deanna and Max, especially. In Ice Dance, we have my children, as Sarah Hughes, not Olympic champion, often calls them because I'm, I agree with her. I guess I'm the other parent, is Marjorie LaJoy and Zachary Lega, Piper Gillis and Paul Poirier, and the controversial choice of Laurence Fournier Boudreau and Nicolas Sorensen. And that's all I'm going to say about that one. The men is the other one that I feel is a little controversial. Wesley Chu, no notes, obviously. Champion of Canada deserves to go. Did great at Four Continents. Did fantastically. Has just shown that he's the one to watch. In the second slot, we have Roman Sadovsky. I love Roman and I want great things for Roman, but I was a little surprised by this one. Roman has barely competed this season for a variety of different issues. When he has, he has done the Roman thing, which is show all of the promise of a great deal of talent, but uh, not necessarily a ton of commitment and a real difficult time landing jumps. But the rest of the Canadians men field is in trouble right now. I mean, Stephen Gogolev has been injured, and so he really wasn't able to fully compete at the Canadian Nationals, and he is still coming back from those injuries, so he wasn't ready for it. And then you had Conrad Orzel, who was in the past the guy I would have thought of as the more stalwart, consistent skater had a really bad end to his season. So I don't know. I mean, Roman's as good as any of them, I guess. I guess so. And I mean, as I have said many times this season, I want nothing more than Roman to show up and be exceptional. So please, please do that. Whenever you get to Montreal, just summon all of your good vibes and put them out on the ice. I can't wait to see it. So before we wrap up here, I do want to mention that you guys gave us a really great response to our Q&A episode. I can't believe it. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I looked at Adrian and I was like, people are saying so many nice things. And even when they weren't nice and they were arguing with us, I liked it. I'm like, good, argue with us. Please tell us where we're wrong. All of its opinions. So please. Yeah, there's actually there's so many comments on it. And we had a really busy weekend. I haven't been able to catch up with it. So I, I will still respond to everybody over there on the yes. YouTube comments. But it was lovely to see you guys interact with it. Uh, so again, thank you for all those great questions. Thank you for continuing to just support the show and to engage in the conversation and engage with each other in the comments. We love seeing all of that. Again, we're, you know, we're barreling towards the end of the season here. We've got the uh, Junior World Championships coming up here. And then not too long after that, we will finally have Worlds. So 
that's uh, what we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. Oh, and we forgot gold in our hearts. Oh, no. I mean, it should be super duper obvious. But Wendy, who is gold in your heart from this week? Oh, my. I can't decide. It's Yune Aoki. Obviously, it's Yune Aoki. <laughs> yes, it's absolutely Yune Aoki. I want to pay for billboards to drive by her home that say, Yuna, you're not allowed to retire. Don't you even think about it. <laughs> you're not even at That's your... both sweet and creepy. Well, sure. That's why I didn't say I was going to go do it. I just said that we'd hire a service to do it. And... Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is a skater who's even hit her peak yet. Watching her at this event and watching her on the Grand Prix this year, you've seen a skater that still has a higher threshold. She has incredible artistry. She has beautiful jumps. That free skate is gorgeous. And her short program was absolutely amazing. These were world-class programs. And this is a skater who needs to stay in the fight because even in a deep field like they have in Japan, she is something special. And I, I just want to keep seeing her in the competitive world. With that, I think we should bid everyone adieu for today. Yeah. So for Scoreography, I'm Adrian Buskey. And I'm Wendy Buskey. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.